Hey guys, welcome back. It's me, Gimpy, and I'm here with uh, the flight and the attack turns for the Doolittle Raid, Enemy Coast Ahead, by GMT. Uh, I decided to go ahead and do the flight and the attack turns together due to the fact that the flight segment is not horribly in-depth. Uh, the video wouldn't be very long if I just covered the flight segment, and the attack turn is in the middle of it. All right, so um, it would be a little more difficult to try to distinguish between the two. I mean, I could do it, but it's gonna be easier and probably more educational for you guys to see it done this way versus trying to uh, split the two up. So I'm gonna pick up where I left off on the naval turn. Now, unfortunately, if you watched my previous video, uh, I started my launch procedures in the naval turn and I was gonna do the rest of that off camera, which I did. Now, unfortunately, um, I applied the takeoff procedure to the first flight here, which was fine. You know, the I originally had rolled a botch flight for it, and I was like, okay, I'll just do that for the second flight and have these guys take off, and I'll deal with the rest of them off camera. You know, did janking it a little bit, but it's my game, and you guys are stuck watching it. So uh, it was to save myself a little bit of time. So I went ahead and put them there with their fuel markers. I set the time, which I'll touch on here in a sec and went to roll the rest and ended up having the worst thing that could happen which basically killed my carrier and destroyed the flight and uh, made it to where I couldn't launch any other B-25s. I decided to go ahead and just run with it. Uh, this will actually make the video a little more streamlined as it is. Uh, just worrying about one flight pushing their way across. I'm not gonna have a whole lot of good results because as it is, my task force turned around and came back home with the rest of the bombers still on there. So Doolittle is leading a raid of three bombers across the flight line, uh, heading towards Japan and hoping for the best. So one of the uh, things that you do when you start your, naval, uh, your flight turn here is you pick what time you want it to be. Let me take and zoom in over there real quick. This is up in the top corner of your map. The black um, boxes are night, the light boxes are day, and if you play an earlier scenario or if you have an emergency launch, your launch window is assigned for you. For example, if you do an emergency launch, you're right here at the 1000 flight window. However, if you succeed in having a planned launch, then you do get to pick what time you want. And you're gonna take this little marker here, if you'll zoom in, and place it on there. And it has two spots on it because you've got Japan time and China time, and they're two hours apart. So whatever time it is in Japan is gonna be two hours earlier in China. So the marker is big enough to cover two hexes. And you want to pick that somewhere that is going to be advantageous for you. Uh, ideally, you want to be hitting your target in the daytime. So for where I uh, am launching from, where I was able to launch my uh, one and only flight, um, I decided to start it right at the tail end of the night, getting ready to go into morning. That way, my first turn is going to be there. My second turn, depending on how things go, um, will be early in the morning, but by eight o'clock in the morning, I'll be hitting Japan regardless, no matter what. So that's going to work out for me. You guys can take and pick what works for you. It's your game. You know, just play it however you enjoy it. Now, uh, like I did previously, I'm going to do just a quick overview of how it's done and then do my, uh, playthrough segment of it. That way, if you're wanting to just here the overview, you can watch that part and then uh, skip the playthrough if you want to do that. When you start your, or end your naval turn, all right, it's going to end with your launch. Hopefully you'll launch off more flights than I launched off. You're going to take your flight markers and you're going to place it on the board on its low altitude side. There is a high altitude side on the back, but that requires of fuel, which you guys will see. Now you're gonna take and decide where your guys are launching from in your naval turn. I ended up launching from Defense West right here at the close part of 
uh, Japan. So that worked out fairly well for me. I was able to skip three of the early um, flight turn boxes, which would just be extra hazards. Very similar to the naval turn, you have type one, type two, and then type three hazards. And what I find kind of neat is that the type two hazards are leading up to Japan. And then after you do your attack is when you start encountering <clears throat> the worst, the type three hazards. And that's when you're trying to uh, get your flights back to land either in China or Russia, wherever you're going to land. So they, it's kind of to represent the uh, enemy picking up you know, their alert status because they've just been attacked. Now, similar to your naval turn, down here at the bottom of your flight map, let's take and zoom in on it a little bit, you can see where it lists down the hazards that you're gonna take and draw for each specific area. The one that I start with right here, it's just a simple type one type two hazard. You draw that, you resolve it. It's listed down in the um, player aid, just like it is for the naval turn, so it's relatively easy to handle. And then as you move closer, you're going to be encountering more hazards. That first one that I'm gonna be encountering is just one type two. The next one, it's one type two per flight. And then you're getting plus your alert level per flight, not to exceed the alert level. So if you have an alert level of three and you've got a couple of flights, then you're gonna add one alert hazard to each one. Don't add an extra type two hazard. You add the specific alert hazard, which has alert across the back of it, little uh, Japanese zero on it, so it's easy to pick out which one it is. And you're gonna do the same thing as you progress across the board. It does, like I said, get progressively harder as you're going across. Now, something else that you have to keep track of as you're going across is the wind. You can either have a headwind, a crosswind, or a tailwind. Headwind, the wind blowing at you. Crosswind is blowing across your planes. Tailwind is blowing from behind, so it can help push you along. The wind is kept tra uh, track of along the bottom. Now, this is dependent on your uh, weather check that you had in the sea area when you launched. For example, I had Gusty when I launched here. So when I do my weather check for these boxes, that's the weather that I'm gonna use as Gusty to determine what it is. Now, if you are in a area that does not have a weather check marker in it in your naval area, you will take and perform a weather check and then do your wind check to see what type of wind you're gonna have in that area. When you get a little bit farther on, I zoom in on this box right here so you guys can see it, the wind checks actually have their own um, weather checks in it. So you'll do a quick weather check and then a wind check to see what it's gonna be. So it's gonna be a couple of different uh, checks to keep track of. The wind check is not actually performed on the board. The chart for that's not on the board. It is here in your player aid for your flight turn. So you can see you're gonna be looking at either it's calm, gusty, gale, or storm, depending on what you have, and then you're going to roll and just reference the chart to see what type of wind you're gonna have. And good for us, right below it, weather effects, it tells you what type of uh, things are gonna happen uh, with different weather that you have. Now, you have your first turn of your uh, of the flight turn, or your first phase of the flight turn, rather, is gonna be moved. It's just gonna be a straight moving your uh, flight one hex forward. It does not consume fuel, but if you want to climb, if you want to go to um, a higher level, see if I'm gonna push him forward, which I am my first turn, I'm gonna push him forward and take him to high altitude. If you don't have any fuel on board, then you have to do a flying on fumes check. Your flying on fumes chart is right here on your flight uh, turn chart. And this has to do with uh, basically how much fuel your, your planes have. If 
you run out, there is a chance you can keep going, uh, sputter on, basically. But each time you're having to perform a flying on fumes check, you start getting more and more negative modifiers. You keep having to put those little markers onto your flight, and for each one of those that you get, you're having to add an extra die that you roll. And just like everything else in the game, you're rolling two dice, you're consulting your chart. Well, now, if you have one of those, you're gonna roll three dice and take the worst two. And then if you get past that one and go again, you're gonna roll four and five, and it just keeps on going indefinitely until you're gonna run out of fuel. And at that point, you can end up ditching down, sputter on, uh, just depending on what happens. Now, as you're pushing along, you're resolving your hazards, which just like your naval term, are all listed down in your um, flight term uh, player aid. It goes through everything. Again, I would recommend the first couple of times that you play it to take and uh, use the book to reference the flight hazards just to check it. This does an excellent job of covering it, but you don't want to miss any of the minute details uh, just from the uh, player aid. When your flight hits Japan and you make a successful target acquisi uh, acquisition check, which is going to be that small number on the box. If you see right there on Osaka, you have a 7 and a 9. Those are your daylight and nighttime, uh, respectively, target acquisition checks. And like I was saying previously, this is when those uh, selections that you made in training and uh, earlier and all that uh, comes into play because your, what's it called, uh, your navigation and your night flying training, that's going to affect these. Uh, if you decided to take and risk having that submarine right there by Japan in contact and get those contact markers there, then you get uh, extra re-rolls to take and attempt to make your target acquisition check. Now that check is done just like everything else. You roll two dice. You're looking to meet or beat that number. You can see the daylight number is lower. So of course you want to have your planes hitting in daylight if at all possible. Uh, and you're gonna subtract whatever modifiers you have uh, for it. Again, in your play rate chart, it's gonna list it down. Your acquisition check, whatever modifiers you're gonna have, things for like submarines, elite pilots, uh, if there's blast markers, so if you've had a flight go through and they've actually put bombs on target, you're gonna have a, uh, a modifier for that. Like I said, with your training, and then if you have contact markers, which I didn't get because I didn't wanna risk all those hazards, uh, you're gonna get extra rerolls. So now you do get a chance to have a reroll if you're at high altitude. So that's a uh, another good reason to have uh, your planes up high. Now one of the things I do to help remind myself is you see the little markers here. That's your detonation. Let me pull it in. Your detonation marker and then the light marker. That's lights on and then lights out. I go ahead and put one of those with each one of the main city targets and I go ahead and put the attack turn marker and phase marker uh, right there so I have them, I know where they're at and they're ready for the attack turn. Because once your flights hit this, hit Japan, you break from the flight turn segment and you go into your attack turn segment. After you make your successful target acquisition, whatever place that you're attacking, you're gonna take and pick up that chart and depending if you acquire it in daytime or at nighttime and this is so neat they have it light or dark depending on what you uh, hit and I love this that there are separate hazards for the actual target depending on when you hit it so it it, it simulates like their alert level uh, during the daytime versus nighttime and that's just neat as all to me I gotta say I just love that now this is your direct attack. This is what you've been trying to do. You're gonna take and your planes will come in from one of the periphery, periphery uh, areas. Each area is divided by one of these black lines 
and your ultimate goal is to put bombs in one of these direct targets. You might not do it, you might end up just doing area damage where they got close and you'll put blast markers there. But my plan, say for example, my plan on this is to come in here, Nagoya is a easier target so I thought it would be an easier one to film. I plan on having my flight come in from this direction and you have a number which you can see there's seven and eight. That is your, what is it called, the approach. Let me grab the attack turn real quick. Yeah, that's your approach check, and then you have a detonation check. So you're gonna take and try to meet or beat that number with your modifiers, and then, um, like your training modifiers, they'll take effect that. If you take and succeed, your plane will take and come in, be parked on that. You can only have one B-25 on top of it at a turn. You'll make your detonation check, which is that smaller number by the side. And then once your planes are unloaded, you're going to exit them off the map. Down here at the bottom is your turn track. Pay attention to the fact that if you do progress to turn 9 and you're playing a later scenario like scenario 10, which is the whole way through, you can have more than just 9 rounds. It just indicates that it's going to cost you a fuel if you stay there. The neat part about this is it simulates the fact that they're unaware by how many detonations have happened here. So if you've had no detonations, that's minus three to the amount of hazards you have to draw for this target map. So for example, this one for max, that's the max that you can have. It's going to be plus one for each B-25 and then, you know, so on. There's other modifiers for it, which I'll get into when I get into the uh, playthrough of this. But early on, the uh, hazards are reduced because they haven't had any uh, bombings yet, so they're not on the lookout. So if you keep sending flights to the same area and you're trying to bomb it all out, you're gonna keep adding the detonations to it. They don't clear off in between flight turns. So if flight one comes and they do their bombing run and they leave and they, you go back to the flight turn and then flight uh, your second flight comes in and is bombing the same area, the blast markers stay there, the uh, number of detonations that have happened stay there. So they're gonna be on more alert and you're gonna be drawing more and more hazards. I just think that's so neat. Now keep in mind though that if the time of day changes, you're gonna actually have to remember where all your markers are at, flip your uh, map over and put them back down on you know day or night side, depending on uh, what changed when the next flight goes through. Keep in mind that if you have multiple flights, unlike me, hitting Japan, you're going to be handling them separately. You're not gonna have six or eight or nine, 10, whatever planes on one target map. Whenever a flight hits and they make their target acquisition check, you take and immediately go in to your bombing run. So the most you're gonna have on one of those maps at one time is four due to the fact that you can only have four in one flight. At that point, when your bombing run is done, you take and just continue out the uh, flight turn just as you've been doing with your wind checks, weather checks if needed, and you either head for I think it's Vladivostok, if I said that right, and then down into your landing zones in China if that's what you're heading for. That's the basic gist. Once you've done that, you go into your, den I, I know I butchered this, denouement, denouement uh, phase, which is essentially your scoring phase. How well did you do and um, what happened to your crews, what happened to your task force, what happened to your ships and everything like that. So it's a, a neat thing. You are rolling on things. You're gonna have some modifiers, uh, some things that uh, happen to your planes here can affect uh, that. It's just so neat how it works out. But that's the, the basic gist of how you're gonna play this. The flight turn, very similar to the naval turn as far as making your weather checks, wind checks, doing your hazards. Make sure you keep an eye on what your alert level is and you just interject your attack turn into that and then landing afterwards. All right, I'm gonna break here and then play through one single flight pushing forward. Uh, you guys stick around if you wanna watch it. 
All right, welcome back. If you're sticking around for this part of the playthrough, where we're actually pushing through my one little flight of three bombers to see uh, what they can do. Um, when you first start off, you're in your move phase. You're not going to take and do this on your fir uh, very first flight turn. You're going to skip that, okay? So you're going to go to your win phase. Now, we don't have a win marker in the area that we're in uh, just yet. So we've got to get a win marker. We know that the weather is gusty where we're at. So we're going to take and roll on this chart right here and see what type of weather we get. Hopefully we roll high because we could use a tailwind instead of a headwind. Headwind can mess us up real bad. All right, we got a 10 and a 10 actually gives us a tailwind. So this is this is nice for us. And oh wow, Gusty, that gives us actually a severe uh, tailwind. So we'll take and mark that down. It's unfortunate that we're right here because if we were here it would last us for both of these squares but as it is this is only going to last us for the turn that we're in but we can make a attempt to move with this severe tailwind may move or acquire target i wonder if that's not I can never remember all of these fuel, all these wind things because there's just so many different types of wind. So let's read it out real quick. A severe tailwind. A flight in a zone with a severe tailwind may move. Success is automatic. No guzzle check needed. Outstanding. So that works out very nicely for us. We'll take and go ahead and move forward one. So that's less that we've got to worry about. So yeah, it, we have to figure out the wind for this area but that's not going to be bad and the next turn our move will be automatic we'll be right there on japan and we can take and uh go ahead and get that going let me take and roll for the wind for the area that we're in to see what we've got hopefully the wind will be good to us again we got a seven and a seven on this is going to be a crosswind and it's a severe crosswind so we'll take and mark that down right there severe crosswind and these unlike the weather chits down below in the naval section the wind uh, currents don't change those stay which i don't know i kind of almost hope they would have moved around because sometimes you get some bad ones but it's all right we'll deal with it but this isn't gonna hurt us now we are to our uh, I'm going to have to take it. I wonder. Yeah, I'm going to have to go ahead and take and, uh Sorry, I, sometimes I just talk to myself when I'm thinking things over and I was starting to think strategy out loud. So I'll try to stop doing that when I'm recording a video. Uh, we're at the draw hazards step. OK, we're going to draw hazard markers and apply them. You're always going to take and apply hazard markers evenly to your flights. OK. You can't take and put three on one flight or you know 10 or another whatever you have to draw you have to take and balance them out now let's take and draw ourselves a hazard marker here level two and what did we get we got the boat so there's a japanese boat let me actually pull that up so you guys can see it and from the looking that i did over these uh, at least this area doesn't have as many with the uh, secrecy test on them as did the naval section Which is actually kind of nice because that could hurt us. Let's take a look at this We're gonna place the vessel in the flight zone then count the total number of vessels on the flight map and roll a die If the number is less than the number of vessels increase the alert level by one and remove one um, vessel marker so since this isn't going to matter for us because the most we can or the least we can roll is one which isn't going to be less than this so we're going to take and just leave that uh, boat where it's at it's not going to take and affect us unless we take and draw another boat at a later point but that shouldn't be too much of an issue we'll just have to see how that uh, how that works out now we take and go to our fuel phase and this is simply 
just taking and accounting for our fuel. Since all those are two barrels, I take and flip it over to the one barrel side. So now I have nine total uh, fuel left on that with five fuel markers. You guys get what I'm talking about. And that's it. That's the, the flight phase in a nutshell. Next, we just move back to it. We're moving. Now I am doing something different on this moving phase. I am gonna take and change my altitude because I wanna be at high altitude when I take and uh, get to Japan. There's a few bonuses. Now do keep in mind that if you take and want to get to Japan at high altitude, you have to have a Norden bomb site to take and do some of your bombing there. Anything besides just area bombing. If you want to go in for a target, you have to have the Norden bomb site. So if you choose or elect not to use that, uh, you remove it for the weight or whatever during your February phase of your planning, come in at low altitude. Now, by raising myself up to high altitude, I had to cost myself one extra fuel for doing that, which is fine. I'm not worried about that. Now, I am in the area to make my target acquisition. Let me take and uh, flick over to that part of the page. So I am there. Oh, forgot I need to move my time marker for the next turn and this is what I wanted it's daylight it's day turn uh, right here for me I got that one extra bump from the uh, uh, severe tailwind earlier so I got there one turn earlier but I am still in daylight which I really wanted I've decided to go after Nagoya which is right here this is gonna be our target I'm gonna take and find a place to set this down and I'll let you guys kind of watch as we go across our bombing raid here. So the target acquisition number is a seven for a daylight raid. We don't have to worry about uh, the lights being on or off at this point, which is nice. I'm gonna take and put my detonation marker at zero. I'm gonna put my turn at one. I'm actually getting a little ahead of myself because I still gotta take and acquire it first. Now, thanks to Doolittle, I do have the ability, a one-off uh, reroll that I can use for him. And being at high altitude gives me a chance to reroll as well. So I'm not horribly worried about making this, um, this check. Now, once I get to the target acquisition, I'm going to bring my bombers in and we're going to go to our attack phase. So let's see if we can do it. I do have a plus two modifier for my navigation, which is uh, going to reduce that down to a five or better. So that's actually pretty good. Let's see if we can get that. Okay, we got it. We got it with a 10. We're good. So flight did acquire it. You're going to take and leave your markers where they're at. Now at this point, you need to take and switch out to your attack player aid, your attack turn player aid. And this one has a lot more things to worry about. A lot of it has to do with hazards and it's just in the order in which you're dealing with the hazards. Placing hazards where they go, because some of them are going to be assigned to the area. Some of them are gonna be assigned to the target. Uh, let me see, let me grab one out of there container real quick just to show you guys try not to cover up the whole camera I apologize ones that have that little marker in the bottom right they're gonna go in a target box one of your red bordered boxes here instead of just the area itself so let's take and since I have been doing well I do get to pick the area that um, I'm entering in let's see what it says about that one oh yeah uh it's one b25 each turn so i don't get to place three b25s down on the map right off the bat so let's take and zoom in a little bit so you guys can see that a little easier there i don't get to take and place all three b25s on the map and just bomb away you're going to have one come in each turn okay and they may not change altitude while they're on the map. They're gonna stay whatever altitude they were while you were pushing across. That's why if you don't have a Norden bomb site, 
you need to stick at low altitude so you're not going to accidentally come in too high to do your bombing runs okay uh, your first turn is going to be right here with your airspeed and it's going to be where you're going to be moving now when you first do it it's you're going to be placing your lead bomber there on whatever peripheral area that you're coming in at and the rest of your bombers are going to be coming in on following turns i'm just going to set them here on the edge to remind myself it's this one then this one then this one we're at our first turn we pan this down so a little bit so you guys can see a little better always hard to get the map just right but this is Doolittle. we are at our airspeed think of airspeed as move okay that's your uh your move part let me make sure i'm not missing anything yeah okay uh i don't have any compass errors faulty compass so i've got no one coming in late now we're at our place hazards we're going to be plus one for each b25 in the area right now i only have one b25 in the area these two aren't in here yet it's just do little coming in okay so i've got plus one for that i've got negative three for detonations because where my detonation marker is move that up a little bit. okay you guys can see there zero detonations is negative three and you add whatever your alert level is strangely enough i've done great i've kept my alert level down this whole game but it hasn't done me a buttload of good because i've got no uh no bombers to take advantage of it all right so my ultimate hazard or hazard draw is actually a negative two at this point plus one minus three so i don't have to draw hazards that means i can skip the place hazards assign hazards evade hazards uh, just make sure you go in order it's just the uh, same as uh, how hazards are used in the naval and the flight turns you're going to divide them up amongst the bombers that are there in that area and you're going to divide it up evenly you're not going to put two on one bomber and zero on another now it's only in the areas that have bombers in them okay that you're drawing hazards it's just like uh, the naval and the flight turns you only draw hazards for the areas that you have uh, units involved in the evade hazards portion if you're at high altitude remember that you can't do anything with this but the hedge hopping uh, training skill that's where this comes into it that's where you uh, determine what your evade is so say for example I had three hazards I had to draw in this area I could remove one of them just fly it out just pull it off remove it and be done with it now that's done before you resolve the hazards themselves okay so before you would flip them you could just pick one to throw back into the cup you can increase your skill up to having two of those uh, that you get rid of if you're playing an earlier scenario you get a standard amount that you get to do now if i had already done my bombing if i had an unloaded b25 i could exit if i was on a area that's on the edge this one they're all on the edge so you can take and fly off actually i think all of them have targets that are on the edge with the exception of uh, tokyo bay which has one center target now i can take and leave but i haven't done my bombing run yet so we go to our approach okay now you're going to take and do your approach check and this is <coughs> excuse me very similar to um what you're doing for uh um i'm brain farting out here uh your target acquisitions okay your tower uh your number in your area that you're going after I'm going to go after this Mitsubishi aircraft factory, which i am zoom in so you guys can see it. The number there in the center is eight and the detonation number is six. Okay. So let's back it back out a little bit and you get to add whatever modifiers. There are some of these hazards that you can draw that will affect your uh, approach check number. And then you get a positive modifier if there's blast markers in the target box that you're going for. So basically, if it's been bombed before, you're going to have an easier time seeing it. All right, so eight's the number that I've got to hit. I have a plus two modifier for my navigation training. Uh, plus one is for your uh, standard scenarios. Uh, my training is at plus two. 
I don't have an elite pilot or anything give me any other bonus, so I have to hit six or better to take and get my bomber directly over the target. <laughs> Doolittle has been shit this game, I'll tell you, man. Doolittle's been crap. Unfortunately, I missed. So, what's going to happen with him is he doesn't get to take and approach the actual place itself. He is just going to get to do an area bombing. And that's going to be handled in our next phase of bombs away. And they're in an area they may drop ordnance. Let me make sure. Yep. They may drop ordnance and it's successful. You only do a detonation check in an area, uh, a target box itself. So, well, I'll tell you what, I'm going to use Doolittle's reroll because I'm not going to have a chance to use it later. I'll just pull his marker off and I'll reroll this to see what I can get. Five. Okay, well, we hit it on that one. So, Doolittle got in there and now we've got to take and do our detonation check. Again, you're adding whatever modifiers you have and scenario 10 it's your bombing um, bonus modifier. You don't get the standard plus two that's used in other scenarios and then any other uh, bonuses that you have. If you, the point of doing this is you get more uh, blast markers on the target if you can take and actually get a detonation check right on top of it. So the number I'm looking for is six. I have a plus one from my training in bombing. So I have to get a five or better to take and put blast markers on target here. Got it. Okay, now we're getting somewhere. So I'm gonna take one of the blast markers, flip it over to its double side, and I'll pull him out, pop that right down there on the Mitsubishi factory. If he had been loaded with extra ordnance, it would actually be three blast markers instead of just two. So that would have worked out nice for us. Now we're done with bombs away. We go right back up to airspeed and we just repeat the process on down the line. Our next plane's coming in. And since Doolittle hasn't left, technically he's still over it. I just moved him to, uh, for ease of movement with the counters. He's going to be leaving though on this turn. Oh, I meant to flip him over. Make sure you flip him over to his little side that's got a metal on it and he's unloaded. It means that they don't have it. If you see right there where they've got their name, they've got a little bomb symbol around their name. That's what uh, indicates that they have ordnance. So he's there. We're going back to our place hazards phase. We've bumped our marker up because we have one detonation that was done uh, on the target. Now I'm at minus two, plus two, because I have plus two bombers. I have two bombers on this area and plus zero for my alert level. So I'm still drawing zero uh, hazards at this point. I'm actually doing well as far as that's concerned. On the next turn, however, this detonation track's gonna be up another one and I only have a minus one, at which point two bombers being there will cause a hazard. So again, no hazards phase to worry about. We're at uh, exit. I do have it unloaded. They can't exit if they have a fighter attached to them or if they still have their bombs. Doolittle comes off and he goes back into his flight formation and we deal with our approach check again on this guy. He is going to be getting plus three because we have blast markers and we have a plus two for our target. He, I really want him to get on target because he has a elite bomber on board. So he'll have a plus one for his detonation check if I can get him on target. So with the plus three, I need a five or better to take and get on target there. Got it, got the seven, okay. So we're gonna take and move him up. I'll just move him to there for ease there since I've got some markers on it. Now we go to our detonation check and I'm going to get the plus one from the training and then the plus one for the elite bombardier. And that's going to mean with the number six to be 
four or higher is going to take and give me another couple of bombs on there. So let's roll it. Got it. We got a six, so we got it. I'm going to take and switch it out for one of these uh, four detonation markers. Should have loaded these guys down with extra ordnance if I knew I was only going to get a few bombers out. I'll take and move him off to the side. And again, we're done with bombs away. We're back to airspeed. This is actually going fairly quickly because this is the first bombing run. You imagine doing this with 18 bombers or 15 bombers or however many you have it make through. If you have more than three make it through or zero technically like I had. Now we're at our place hazards phase and this is going to matter for us because our detonation has gone up. We've had two detonations. We're on third turn. Sorry, I forgot to move that as I was going. And we only have a negative one modifier. Let me make sure I still got that camera. Negative one modifier with two bombers in that area, which means we're gonna draw one hazard. Give me a sec, let me draw one here out of the cup. And it's going to be assigned uh, randomly to the bombers, or not randomly, but to the bombers. I'm gonna take and assign it to this bomber since he's on his way out. It doesn't have the red square around it, so I'm not putting it on top of one of the uh, targets. If it had been the target, it could be stuff like, what do they have? Balloons, um, uh, flak, uh, searchlights, things like that. They have uh, things that can make your bombing runs even more difficult. All right. Now we can evade hazards, which would be great with the exception of the fact that I can't because my guys are at high altitude. So I am going to get hit with this. If one of these had a plane symbol on it, right, one of the Japanese zeros, you could make an attempt with gunnery to take it out. Now, uh, pay attention to the fact, though, that gunnery is done prior to resolve hazards. Okay, so you might fire at a marker that is, um, what's it called, breakaway, you know, so it's not technically hurting you. Now let's take and resolve our hazards, see what we got. All right, this one is flak, okay? The way flak's gonna work is you're gonna take and roll two dice, and if it's in between, if it's those numbers basically, if it's in between two or three, so if I roll a two or three, uh, the bomber's going to take damage. Yep. There's actually a little chart right here that just shows you. Basically, if you hit those numbers, then you take damage. So let's roll two dice real quick and hope that we don't hit the two numbers that we're trying to miss. Otherwise, I'm going to have to get a damage marker for my guy. Okay, we're good. We got 11, so he's good. We resolved that hazard, and now we go down... We have another unloaded bomber because he made his bombing run. He's going to come off in the exit phase. He's out of the map now, and we're back down to our approach. Our approach, we've got plus one, plus two. We're <clears throat> looking for, well, I'll tell you what. Let's take and try to bomb a different one just for giggle's sake. We'll go after this one, so we need a five or better for uh, the target acquisition on the steam plant. <clears throat> Unfortunately, it's a little higher bombing number, but we'll just see if we can do it. And look at that, 12, we got it. Okay, so we are over target. Now, we're gonna need a seven or better because the only modifier we've got is our training, which is a plus one. So we're gonna take, hit it, oh, we got it. We ended up getting a 12. So, we're going to take <clears throat> an, <clears throat> excuse me, another plus two and bump this up by one, bump our turn up by one. Now, we are going to have to take and resolve one more hazard before we can leave because that's what's done in this phase. That's how they do it. You can't have uh, exit down here first. So, flip him over to unmarked. And let's take and do another hazard real quick. Give me a sec while I grab one. And 
take and set it. <clears throat> it can only be attached to this bomber since he's the only one on the board, so we'll flick it. And it's another flak. So three or four, and he's gonna take damage, otherwise he's okay. All right, that's good. It was a three and a four, but that came out to seven, so we're good. <clears throat> we'll throw this one back up, and he's gonna come back out on the board. And now remember, at this point, if you had other flights still pushing through, you're gonna leave these uh, uh, detonation markers on their targets. You're gonna leave the detonation marker where it is. So if you have further flights come through into this area, there, like I said previously, you're gonna keep increasing it. And if you bomb it up to nine times, it's gonna be adding four hazards on top of, you know, what else you're gonna be drawing. But on the bright side, there is a max that can be drawn for each area, so that does help balance that out a little bit. The attack turn does reset, though. That's the only thing that you are going to take and pull off. So we'll take and push this out of the way. Put that back over where it was. And grab my little dice here. And back it up. And that's, that's how it's done at that point. You take and... I'm gonna, I have to cut this video short. One of my kids is uh, going a little nuts, so I gotta go help out with that real quick. I do apologize. But at this point, you would continue with your flight segment either heading towards China or you're heading towards Russia, depending on where you wanted your uh, landing zones to be. And one other thing that I wanted to make sure that I mentioned is if you were able to set up a landing zone then what landing beacons you put down that number is going to be your target acquisition number instead of the numbers that are in the box the landing zones have the same type numbers that the rest of the places have you have a daylight number and a nighttime number that you need to hit that's why you really wanted to have a landing beacon in one if you could to take and have a better number to shoot for for example, if I pushed on through doing the hazards and got my guys down to this one and went for this area to land there, I would take and need to roll a six modified with whatever modifiers that I had uh, to get to it. Uh, same thing for Korea and Vladivostok, except for the fact that they don't have landing beacons. They do have uh, numbers that you needed to meet, beat to uh, land there. At this point, once you've done that the game is pretty much over unless you want to do the denouement denouement phase one of you guys let me know how the hell you say that and like I said this is your epilogue of what has happened it's just like all the rest of them you start you go down the line depending on what happened and it's rolling your dice and comparing it to what you've had happen in all your different areas your ditch checks return to port so i would have to do that for uh, some of my ships because they did return to port if uh, if you guys got captured if they got shot down there's so many different things but this basically tells the story for you of your raid what happened to your guys if you play the full uh scenario 10 game start to finish and some of your guys were shot down you know past japan in between japan and china do they get rescued do they get captured this is what you do to find out what happens with them uh, you can even have uh, the effects during landing to uh, see how they did did they continue on to chun king uh, there's a lot uh, that gets into it i like how they have that uh, storybook ending into it see right here where i was talking about uh, depending on your role you know, captured, missing, you know, things like that. You have modifiers. If you've got subs, were they rescued? It's just neat how they uh, handle all that. I do have to say again, if you like games like Silent Victory, uh, The Hunters, um, Warfighter, you know, games of that ilk, you will like this game, right? It's definitely right up your alley. The like I said in the, the first video, what really gets me is the planning phase. It's 
all the choices you make at the beginning and how they affect you. They affect you a little more in the naval section. They start to affect you a little bit more in the flight section because then you're actually pushing your bombers along. And then they affect you a lot more in the attack segment because all of it's coming into play. You know, how many dice are you rolling if you uh, get gunned down or if you get an interceptor on you, you know, things of that nature. And then, hey, did I make the right choices along? Do I have enough fuel to take and push through uh, onto the landing zones? You know, when you're doing your uh, weather checks as you're going along, you know, did you push it too hard uh, as you're going along and you don't have enough fuel to make it to any of your landing zones and you're going to have to ditch? It's a very good storytelling game about a very interesting mission that was done in our past. Like I gotta say, they did a good job of representing such an intense mission in game form, especially with how secrecy and keeping the information from the enemy is played out. And, and just like real life, that one unlucky thing, that uh, you know, enemy merchant trawler that was out in the ocean, you know, just kind of spotting for the Japanese that the task force happened to stumble upon can you know ruin all the plans that you made months of work and labor and secrecy and staying off the phone can be destroyed because one guy was in the wrong place and spotted you out and told the japanese and that pushed your alert level up would made which made your bombers get shot down you know it's just interesting how the game works i guarantee you'll like it if you uh, are into the solitaire uh hunters silent victory style gameplay like i said the it's that startup that really gets to you. Do I plan well enough to execute the whole thing? Did I make the right decisions? It really does play out. Anyway, that's it for Gimpy today. You guys take care. I'll see you in the next one.